Shalom. Welcome to Through the Eyes of the Elder Discussion Series. We're glad you could join us today. I want to read you something in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 25 through 27. He shall speak pompous words as commands against an adversary, the Most High Supreme, shall persecute and wear out the saints of the Most High Supreme, and shall intend to change by altering times, appointed seasons, and the law of commandments. Then the saints shall be given into his hands as power over them for a time of a year, a times of two year, and a half a time, which is a half a year." But the court of his tribunal shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom of dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people corresponding of Israel and the saints who are holy of the Most High Supreme. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. I'm reading this because... Last week, we put out a video, He is Alive, the Beast of Revelation. Hear him and see him for yourself. And so far, we haven't had much response from that. And to me, that's a confirmation that the great delusion that is spoken of in the Scriptures has gone out. Surely, we thought that people would be quite shocked and surprised at the revelation of this man that we have introduced to the world but that hasn't happened. And so that's an interesting lesson that we're learning is that people have fallen asleep spiritually and they're comfortable with where they are and they don't see any need to pay attention to this or to change. That's sad because that's not the words written in scripture. We're supposed to humble ourselves to Yahweh's words. And he promised that this man was going to come, but it seems like nobody thinks that this is going to affect them in any kind of a way. Well, today's video is a follow-up for what we promised last week. We said we would begin to uh, combat some of the teachings of this beast uh, man that's come on the scene and the things that he's saying. And so I read this scripture because in this, this rebuttal that we're going to do today is exactly that. He's speaking pompous words against the Most High. And he started doing that. And he's got other ones that we'll come across later on. But we wanted to get this one out because we want to see the gravity of how far this man will go to twist the scriptures and convince people of his way of thinking. So with that being said, today we're going to um, we're going to deal with a video that he put out. I don't remember when but it's called The Fifth Covenant with Jesus Christ, The Shocking Truth Behind the Last Supper. That's the title of his video, and we'll put a link down below so that you can actually go watch the whole version itself. The purpose of this particular rebuttal today is not only to rebut, but to show you some clips of statements that he he states, significant statements that he states that has to be addressed. We can't be allowing it to go by the wayside uh, unrebutted. So that's what we're going to do today. So I'm joined by my good brother and my friend, Anthony. Um, we weren't planning on doing something this quick, but I felt really heavy in the spirit that it need to be done. And uh, so here we are, and we put this together. I'm hoping that this is going to help people to see more in depth of how this man is very persuasive and how the methods and the techniques that he uses to try to twist the scriptures just enough that he can convince the public of his theology and win them over to his side. And so uh, here we are. This is what we're going to do today. So uh, the floor is yours to put your two bits in, whatever that is. So no, before um, we get started, as as we go along piece by piece, um, I'm reminded of a, a writer of a movie. You know, um, he writes the movie. He hires the people to play their um, particular roles for his movie. But the one thing he has on the audience is he knows the end. And the audience has to sit there and go through the movie and be in suspense about the end. But the thing about this author of the Bible, he's already showed you the end from the beginning. And so I'm just amazed that the people that 
don't know the ending of the story and that someone comes in and presents them a different narrative and a different ending to the story when you already know the story it's been presented to you so it just amazes me that um it's hard to get people to uh declare which side they're on so they sit quietly you know and they don't know what to agree with so the enemy comes in and he sells them different stuff that was sold already in the beginning in the garden. Mm -hmm. And he's showing you at the end, it's still going to be sold to you. Was did Yahweh really say that? Is that the way he really wants you to live? Is that the way that he really actually lived? And we declare that he is holy, but we let others come in and present to us that he wasn't really holy and what he called unholy isn't really unholy. So it's the same question. Did he really say it? And we're presenting this. Did he really say it today? And I have to examine myself and, and, and make a, a, a statement. Yes. He said what he said. And if anybody else come to me and say, no, he didn't really say it. He changed his mind. Mm. Am I going to believe that? Or am I going to believe him that he changed not? And so for me, this is the, the uh, narrative I want to present on my part standing here. I know where you're coming from. You're declaring an identity and I want to declare a different identity, the identity of Yeshua. Is it in you? Mm -hmm. Examine yourself. Yeah. So in this last week, since that video went out, had a few Christians respond that this doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about it. I don't care about it. I'm already saved. Um, I'm going to be raptured out of here. I mean, there's all kinds of cliche statements that are made. And it just goes to show you how ignorant they are of their own Bible, mm -hmm. that they don't understand the prophetic timeline of these things. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm reminded of uh, the scripture in Revelation chapter 3 about the Lady of Deceans, yes. how they're neither hot nor cold, mm -hmm. and that he's going to vomit them out of his mouth because they're neither hot nor cold. They're lukewarm. They're tepid. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say that you're poor, blind, miserable, and naked, and you can't even see your nakedness. Mm -hmm. But when I'm looking at somebody that's making those kinds of statements that this doesn't apply to me, I don't care. You're, you're showing me your nakedness, your spiritual nakedness, that you are now showing me that you are ripe for receiving the final mark of the beast, because the mental state that you're in is already showing me that the mark is present because you're thinking exactly the way this beast wants people like you to think so that when he does come on the scene, which I believe he is now here, as we've shown, mm -hmm. you're ready to receive his final mark mm -hmm. and enter into that system. It's going to be a no brainer. And 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 just to um add a little bit to what you just said it ain't about you caring about you uh because you feel safe what about your neighbor is your neighbor safe mm. what does it compel you to go out and warn them to get ready you know that they don't receive or they don't receive his um punishment that he's threatening them to be with that they are able to endure it does it compel you as a, a believer as one that professes to have the spirit of yeshua living in you does it compel you to go out there and minister or warn the ones who it does apply to mm -hmm. and that's that's the position we are taking we're taking okay this this person declares he is that person. So I'm going to alert y'all. Are you examine yourself? Are you ready for him? Are you ready to endure his threats? I would conclude no. I I would conclude I agree with you. So I I think I need to say something here that um if you're just watching this video for the first time, 
it might be a little confusing what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So you need to really go back and watch the first video we did last week, mm -hmm. which I had mentioned earlier about he's alive, the beast of, of revelation, see and hear him for yourself. Yes. And, um, and there you'll get introduced to that. And then this will begin to make a little more sense. Uh, but for today, we are going to address this uh, teaching. And he's very creative, but I would expect somebody under the influence of a spirit such as Hasatan to be able to have that kind of wisdom and knowledge. Not only the fact that Yahweh said that in his days he will prosper and he will make gains against the holy people of the Holy Covenant, and he'll make gains against the Jews and so forth in Israel. So there's nothing unusual about that. But our job is to try to get people to understand not only what this is, but now we're going to go into the area of just how deep this man thinks and how he formulates his argument. So I want to state up front some of the things that maybe the audience should be looking for if they choose to go and watch the whole video. So I've watched a lot of his videos and some of the distinctions that I've come away with is he likes to cite sources that are ambiguous. In other words, he doesn't usually put something up on the screen like we do and show the source, you know, and read it out. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm not sure what some of those sources are that he's speaking of, so I can't verify where he's getting it from. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, whatever source he is reading from to expound on a concept, if that source is saying what it's saying and it contradicts what the Scripture says, you have to discard it. It's not credible. Mm -hmm. So as a believer— in Yahshua, Jesus, Messiah, mm -hmm. that's the first order of business, mm -hmm. is to compare what somebody's saying with the Word mm -hmm. and make sure that they agree. And if they don't, they don't. So a lot of the stuff he says outright is not substantiated by two witnesses in Scripture. Right. So that fails the litmus test. But then again, he's the kind of person that's banking on dealing with people who don't know their Bibles. Right. I told this to a friend of mine. I said, if you don't know your Bible inside and out, this man's going to swallow you up. So you need to learn how to defend yourself. And sadly, you know, he said, you know, I'm not really very good at it. You know, I've slacked off. And uh, that's dangerous, you know. Um, the other thing he will do, he will take a scripture. He will, and you might catch it today. I'm not sure if we have it in some of the clips we're going to show. But he'll take a scripture, he'll um, he'll he'll recite it sort of verbatim, you know, not word for word. Mm -hmm. But I notice subtly he'll leave out certain things and he'll add a little something in, not much, mm -hmm. but just enough that oh, I didn't. That's what the scripture says. Mm -hmm. But if you go, if you know that scripture, you know it. That person didn't state it that way. So that's another tip off. Another tip off is, and this is one of his foundational um, arguments in the way that he operates, is that the Quran is the ultimate authority over all religions. So in other words, what am I saying? What I'm saying is, is that if Moses makes a statement, and he does this in his videos, he'll take Moses or the prophets or whatever, and the Quran expounds on it further. The Quran adds more to the storyline that you won't find in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So the Bible cannot substantiate what he's citing from the Quran. Okay. And so he'll take liberty with that and he'll weave the two together so it sounds very plausible. That's another dangerous trick that he uses. It's sort of like in the Garden of Eden when he came to Eve mm -hmm. and he said, did, did Yahweh really say that the day you eat of it, you'll die? Mm -hmm. Well, now it's like he's putting a, a doubt in her mind, but now it's like, you know, he's got a point. 
did he really mean that by what he said? Mm -hmm. And so now you you go and you start questioning the authority and you believe the lesser authority. Mm -hmm. So this is another subtle tactic that's used. And I see that it goes over most people's heads. The other sources that he'll use is um, vain imaginations. Mm -hmm. We're going to see that today when we start pulling up some of these clips. Mm -hmm. Another source is, that he uses is the hadiths. So the hadiths are basically, uh, from what I understand, imams who have written expository documents on what Muhammad has said or what the Bible has said, and they give whole storylines. Well, I'll probably introduce one of those stories in here to make a point when we get to it. Um, and so they'll he'll use those hadiths as if they're gospel, they're truth. And it take but those storylines take what the Bible says and it goes way out into outer space compared to what the literal face interpretation of what you're reading actually says. We're going to see that today. Okay. Uh, bear with me, everybody. This is important that you really understand how the mind of Satan works when it wants to manipulate people's thinking and bring them into captivity. You know, the scripture says, be harmless as a dove, but wise as a serpent. Mm -hmm. And the serpent is very wise in how he formulates his arguments. And I know none of us like to believe that we um, are susceptible to believing what the devil tells us. But if you're really honest with yourself, you probably buy a lot of it hook, line, and sinker and been duped and paid the consequences. Mm -hmm. So everybody has some sort of an experience with that, that, that concept. Um, he'll use Talmud occasionally, and he'll use Jewish mystical writings. And again, in those things, it takes you in a storyline that is not found in the Bible. And it, and it actually, in some cases, like in one that he used in another teaching, and I'm going to stop here, we're going to get into this. He used the Sefer, um, Zechariah, Sefer Zechariah. And some of the storyline says what Zechariah says, but it has Zechariah then going off on a journey and doing and saying things and laying out prophecy at the end times, mm -hmm. which were not in the right order. And some things were thrown in there that are not found in scripture at all. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know that, you have no way to know that you're being duped. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to take a moment and just explain to people. These are some of the strategies that are contained within his video, in all his videos, really. And, and if you're not on guard, you're going to get caught and you're going to be in trouble. And the reason why I'm emphasizing that is because the first video we put out last week, mm -hmm. the reaction to it or lack of told me a lot about where people are today. They've already bitten hook, line and sinker into what they've been told. And they don't see any reason to have to address any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so today, um, just to give a brief introduction, he's going to go through some arguments about and dialogue about um, Moses, prophets, and so forth. And what he and this is another thing he does. He'll he'll go different places and he'll give examples of what he believes the interpretation is mm -hmm. in his own opinion, as well as from the Hadith and the Quran and other writings and so forth. And then what he'll do is he'll get, he'll establish that point and he's hoping that you've bitten into that or nibbled at the bait. Mm -hmm. I'll say it that way. Mm -hmm. You know how fish just nibbles on a bait, but he doesn't grab the hook actually. Mm -hmm. So he'll lay that out there. Then he'll go to another example in scripture. And he'll say, see, the same thing that happened over here, it's now happening over here with this person. Mm -hmm. And then he'll go through the Old Testament and he'll give another example. Then he'll start going into the New Testament and he'll start using that same analogy into the New Testament with different characters and with the Messiah. And he shows a pattern that at face value now all looks like he's correct. Mm -hmm. 
but he's not. And so this is what we're going to do today. We're going to go through this. And so his primary, so you know what to look for. His primary argument is that in the scriptures and in Hebraic culture, in the past, starting from Moses on, uh, Moses on downward, all the way to Yahshua, Jesus, is it, it's about the feet mm -hmm. and that the feet represent genitals. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so in the title of this uh, discussion today, I had put about sexual perversion at the Passover table mm -hmm. because this is where it's going. Mm -hmm. And it's important that people understand just how maligned the Passover the, the Lord's last Passover supper, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, has been so maligned and so destroyed by this man in this teaching that we just had to call this out. Mm -hmm. But we want to do it in a methodical way that people can follow along with the arguments he's making and the counters that we're going to give. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pull up a video clip the, the clip number one, we got 12 clips or short clips where he expounds on these ideas. Mm -hmm. And so the first one, um, he starts talking about how Yahshua has more knowledge than anybody else of his day, mm -hmm. that he blew everybody out of the water. The rabbis couldn't keep up with him. The scholars, the scribe, nobody could keep up with him. The wise guys in the town couldn't keep up with him. He put them all to shame. So he acknowledges that. And this is another thing that he does. He builds the Messiah up on one hand, but then he insults him on the other, mm -hmm. which is why I start off with Daniel about the pompous words right. speaking against the Most High. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go and pull up clip number one. And this is about him agreeing that Yahshua has the most knowledge. He's able to defeat the Pharisees and the non-working scholars in every single debate. One only has to open up the New Testament and see time after time after time that Jesus leaves the scholars of that time speechless, thus proving that he was the most knowledgeable. And he called towards the supremacy of God. He was anti the establishment. He was anti the invaders, the Roman Empire, Caesar. And he was also anti the, um, the scholars and the false kings of Jerusalem, the ones who had uh, beheaded uh, John the Baptist. So the the point of what he's saying here, that the reason why I wanted to include this is nothing spectacular in this, but the point that I want to make with this is, on one hand, he acknowledges the supremacy of the Messiah, Yahshua, Jesus. Okay, fair enough. That that's he's He's right. There's no arguing with him about that. But the problem is. It's like I've encountered so many people is they'll make certain statements, but then they won't include the other scriptures where Yahshua makes true statements that contradicts what this man is teaching. Mm -hmm. And he won't announce those scriptures because it wouldn't serve his purpose. So in other words, how can you say that Yahshua Jesus had all this knowledge that he blew everybody out of the water with his understanding and he was a righteous man, but then at the same time, you won't take the other things that he says, okay? And so that's another tip off where people have to be careful about who you're listening to. You keep bringing up the teaching that we did on who's your teacher, you know? And I invite people to go back and uh, and and listen to that. And so, uh, any thoughts that you have on that particular clip or that idea? No, it's just uh, as as clear as there's no refuting that Yeshua is the wisest. Right. <laughs> right. You know, wiser than than all that were in his era. There's there's no debate in that. So I'm in agree with agreement with him on that statement. Okay. So the next clip that we're going to take a look at is he says that Yahshua Jesus made changes 
on the night on on that night of the Passover, last Passover supper, mm -hmm. with the disciples, that the Sabbath is no longer to be observed. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and pull up that clip and take a look at it. Or he was to be taken off and to be crucified. And in that time period leading up, Jesus also begun to lay out the new laws of the new covenant. So he made changes. As there was, was always additions or subtractions from the laws, the jurisprudence once again changes with Jesus. And so one of the things that Jesus did was that he demonstrated that the, the Sabbath was to no longer be observed. And it was something that the non-working scholars were attacking him for, in which he brought forward in the Gospels the story of David. Okay, so he's claiming that on the Passover night with the disciples, he made changes to the law mm -hmm. because it's a new covenant. This is his premise. Mm -hmm. So with a new covenant, new laws are instituted and maybe other ones are taken out. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see that in Scripture um, the way he's proclaiming it. But there is no example that I'm aware of on any of the Gospels or anywhere in the New Testament that on that night he did away with the Sabbath. And I just want to say here, um, I realize that the public out there doesn't have the extensive background of understanding what this guy teaches to the degree that I do. And I don't have a lot, but I have enough to understand how to break it down. Um, this is really reverting back to the Catholic Church's foundational theology. Mm -hmm. he, he dismisses Christians of all types, but and, and, and that's a long discussion. I'm not going to get into that. But like your Protestants who broke off from the Catholic Church, your Mormons, your non-denominations, all these, all that type of Christianity that doesn't follow Catholicism, what he really wants to do is he wants all of them to come back to the Mother Church mm -hmm. because it's all part of a bigger scheme or scam that he's trying to promote mm -hmm. and bringing all the Babylonian religions together, and he needs them to come back into that fold. Um, but that's really another discussion. Um, and as we know, it was the Catholic Church under Constantine that did away with the Sabbath. And there's a lot of history about that. We have the Nicene Council and I'm not going to go into all that. That's not the point. But the point here is really is that on the Passover evening, there was nothing mentioned by him about ever doing away with the Sabbath. Matter of fact, here we go again. He doesn't use all the scriptures. It says, and as it was his custom, he would go into the synagogue on the Sabbath. Yes. So if one scripture is good for him for his argument, how come you can't use another scripture that refutes your argument? Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is we have to use scripture to refute his argument, which is an argument that doesn't come from scripture. It comes from probably, he doesn't say, but it probably comes from the Quran or the Hadiths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, if he done it away with, then his disciples that were sitting at that table would have stopped acknowledging it after that day. But right. they didn't. Right. You know? Right. And it's written in the scriptures that they didn't because it's written that it was there manner or their custom to go in on the Sabbath, you know, and so and the Gentiles came with and them. the Gentiles wanted the same words that they taught on the Sabbath, taught to them the next Sabbath. Now, see, now that brings up a, another point, which I really don't want to get too deep into, but it goes back to the Catholic issue. And that is, is that his idea is he dismisses the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. And for good reason, if you're thinking the way he thinks, right. it makes perfect sense. I'll give him credit for that. Mm -hmm. Because what Shaul says would contradict a lot of what he says. And he don't want that opposition. Mm -hmm. So if you can just kind of wipe Paul off the map and revert back to the Catholic Church's theology and use that as the foundation for your teachings and your advice to people and so forth, then that makes perfect sense in my mind. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, he just... 
this um I think Paul wrote it to Timothy, which you say he wanted to dismiss any of Paul's writings or his letters um for his um arguments for his position that he's taken on what each events mean, you know, but if we do that, then why would the rest of the disciples accept Paul in as one of them? Knowing that he 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 Good believes point. differently. Right. You know, you don't find none of the other Okay, so I'm gonna tell you that that's another good point. And I think it's important for me to say something here. So he his focus is on the apostle Peter. Mm-hmm. He doesn't mention the other apostles, mm-hmm. at least not in the videos I've seen. But in this idea, he sticks with Peter. Because Peter, in his mind, is the one that went to Rome, Mm -hmm. and Rome is the one that established the true doctrine. Mm -hmm. So all other apostles, including Paul, are irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So anything that you might be able to pull up from Paul that refutes what he's saying, he's going to say he's a heretic. Mm -hmm. You know? So you wouldn't be able to, in his mind, you wouldn't be able to cite that as a source, which is interesting because we're saying, well, you can't cite the Hadith and the Quran about stories in the Bible, which the Bible never says the way you're talking about it. So we're writing that off too. This is what we're trying to tell people to do. Stop going to these external sources are, that are not validated by pure scripture. Scripture's not perfect. Scribes and, and translators have made some mistakes in the scriptures, Old and New Testament, but we understand what most of those are, but it doesn't nullify the rest of the scriptures, which are in harmony with each other. Right. Stick to the trunk of the tree. Stop going out on these branches. This is what this guy's doing. He's bringing people out to the end of the branches where they're going to fall to their death, mm-hmm. their spiritual death. Mm-hmm. Anything else you want to continue with? No, you're good. All right. So the next one clip we're going to pull up is he says that Yahshua Jesus nullifies the law against eating unclean meat on the last Passover supper. Now, I find that to be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and listen to this clip. And also, Jesus nullified some of the rituals and some of the laws that had to do with the purity or the purification of certain foods in which they would eat. He nullified it. He said to his disciples, he said to the scholars, he said, it's not the food which enters through your mouths that causes a person to become impure, but rather It's what comes out of the mouth of the son of Adam that causes him to be impure. Okay, so that's an interesting statement. And again, he's claiming he did change this law on the Passover at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. Okay, not to be found in Scripture. Interestingly, this argument that he's making about what goes into a man doesn't defile him and what comes out is a true statement. Mm -hmm. There's no arguing with that. But like I say, typically to Christians and Catholics who like to eat pork and stuff against the uh, against the commands, against the marriage contract of Messiah, Mm -hmm. because he never ate that stuff. and He never commanded us to eat it either. Mm -hmm. I say to people, I think you're looking at it the wrong way. And let me phrase it this way. Before you put that pork in your mouth, that pork sandwich, a ham sandwich, were you defiled when you put it in your mouth or were you defiled before you put it in your mouth? Mm -hmm. And my argument is you were defiled before you put it in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Because in your mind and in your heart, you desire to eat something that's forbidden. Mm -hmm. And you are just like Adam and Eve, their desire to eat of that fruit already condemned them before they did it. They were already guilty. And so with the ham sandwich, before you put it into your mouth, you are already corrupt. You're already defiled. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So by eating it, all it did was ratify what was already in your heart, mm -hmm. that passion, that desire to taste that ham or that shrimp or the lobster mm -hmm. or the, the, the pork ribs or, you know, whatever people like to eat. Mm -hmm. And I'm not condemning anybody. That's not my point. My point here is a spiritual point based on what he's saying. He's not covering the fact that before you eat of it, you already have been contaminated. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want people to have a takeaway when they do this, yes. you know, and if you have any doubts, look at Isaiah 66. Mm -hmm. It's a prophecy where when Yahshua returns in his glory, mm -hmm. he's going to incinerate everybody who he finds eating the sweat flesh of swine. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can't have non-believers eating pork. Only the ones who are going to get exterminated. But everybody else who believes, so-called believes in Messiah, is eating pork and they get spared. Mm -hmm. Doesn't Yahweh say that I'm not a respecter of persons? There's one law for everybody, you know? But not, not to them and their uh, doctrine of thinking. Yeah, but that's hypocrisy. They're a different kind of sinner. Yeah. You know, they're a better uppity sinner than the sinners that are out there, you know, because they receive Jesus they ain't under the law, so they can break the law, but they 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 got Jesus and they breaking the law don't really apply to them. But yeah. then they want to point the finger out there to the people and they're doing the same thing as the people. Right. Well, they're they're misunderstanding about being under the law. Yeah. It means you're under the penalty of the law, which is death. Mm -hmm. That's what it really means. So you can claim you're not under the law, you're not subject to the law, but you are subject to the penalty of it if you break it. And that's where he is so clever in what he's just yeah. presenting is that um, y'all got it right. The law changed. You're not under that law anymore. And he's really clever with how he does it, because right. I'm telling you, when I was in prison, I used to watch these Muslims and they would come and borrow. Um, the commandments. You remember I told you I had the Ten Commandments? Would the commandments? Yes, and go study in them. Oh. And the reason they would study them is to corner the, the Christians on, on, on the um, institution uh -huh. that you're not keeping these. Oh, okay. Huh? And you're not doing this. They study what you're supposed to and know. And use it against you. And use it against this you is because what this they know doing. you don't do it. This is what he's know? doing. And, and, and I, I'm seeing it. Yeah. It's clever. It's very you clever. You know, yeah. that what you're really reading isn't what you're really reading. <laughs> huh? And that's but true then, a lot of times. Yeah, because you ain't supposed to be doing it. You're, you're literally <clears throat> right. You're, mm -hmm. he, he changed them laws. And every messenger that comes after him or came before him changed different laws till that he get to the end. And he's really consummating that these laws truly don't apply to you when it's so far from the truth. You read that they apply to you. Why would you let the enemy come and take it from you? Yeah, that's interesting. And while you were talking, something hit me about that's coming up, that this point is very important to keep in mind for later, mm -hmm. about this idea, it's not what enters into your mouth that defiles you. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take on a lot more significance when we get to the end of this. So don't forget that concept, mm -hmm. because he's using that idea that you could put anything in your mouth. Mm -hmm. so just hold on to that. Okay. Anything else on that or yeah uh, um the eating of just the the thing was clean and the whole well my narrative on on my my take on it opposed to his is that he's setting his audience up you know and who knows why Yahweh made you stumble across it it could be try to test you for your belief, for your strength and believing and having the Joshua and Caleb faith, despite what everybody else is doing, mm -hmm. to test you to get in the compromise to draw in. Who knows? But the spirit, but he's finding out today 
that that spirit ain't in you, but that Joshua and Caleb spirit still remains in this earth today to some to hold on to that which was given to them. But the fact of the matter, he would take a scripture that was purely talking about unclean hands making your food that you're eating unclean. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take away that whatever Yahweh has deemed unclean right. is still Good unclean. Point. Good but point. he's mm -hmm. they're literally just talking about your hands can't make the food that you're eat, literally eating unclean. Yeah. And mm -hmm. he's trying to say that that was unclean food right then. Well, if it was clean food, why would he even address that it, is, it can't defile you? That you're already defiled within your heart and the things that came out of it was not your dirty, the food that you put your dirty hands on. And actually, along that vein, the one that's claiming defilement of uncleanliness is what's coming out of him against somebody that he has no legal argument to say that's true. Yeah, exactly. So he's the one that actually was unclean by what he was saying yeah, exactly. in his indignant attitude. And so he's playing to the crowd yeah. to leave them where they are in error. We're petitioning. We're trying to compel them to come out of the error. He's lying to you. He's deceiving you. And, and our voice is so minimal, so soft, they can't hear it because the strongness of his voice to, say, to cater to the flesh, yeah, right. have whatever you want. Right. Hmm? But what Yeshua say goes into your heart, murders, adultery, fornication. And he went on, but he didn't mention food because food is just for your belly. Mm -hmm. it, it's not for your heart. Mm -hmm. And so we tend, uh, as we're described, just dumb sheep. We tend to just continually choose to walk into the role of the dumb sheep, just being led right to the slaughter, not paying attention to the one that got destroyed for doing the same thing. Just going along, not paying attention because somebody laying some bait out there to draw you to this pit, you know? And so... For me, when I hear stuff like that, you know, that all the way through the prophets, through each dispensation, he's saying laws were changing. And now we're at the final supper and he's still changing laws. But isn't that what Daniel said? He would seek to change Torah law and times mm -hmm. and seasons. He's... The Sabbath is is a time and a season, mm -hmm. and he's telling you don't need to keep that no more. Yes. It's, it's so he's fulfilling out of his mouth what Daniel said he was going to do. That how many people you and I know that have received that and left off from the Sabbath? Oh, so he's not talking to the ones that's already left off. No, Y'all remain. Owns them. Yeah. I'm, I, I got more mm -hmm. to come to persuade. I got more to convince. To not hold on to that which you had from the beginning. Let the beginning stuff go. Well, um, when you let the beginning stuff go, you letting go the fact that that lie was there in the beginning. And the evidence of that lie, because that lie brought death in, it brought sin in, and it brought these very laws in. For without the law, Sin was already in the world, but it couldn't be inputted until he made a law. How many people out there will tell us today that sin ain't still in the world? <laughs> so it's sin, sin still here. The law is still yeah, here. Right. Because right. that's the only thing that's going to tell you that sin is here. So how can you be persuaded so easily that one of the very thing that tell you that the thing that was already here is still here, but the thing that tells you that it's here is gone away. But see, Anthony, Yahweh said, I will send a strong delusion that we read last week yeah. that they have to believe the lie. Mm -hmm. You have to. You don't have any choice. It's like Judas. He had to do what he had to do. Mm -hmm. 
Man. It was written of him back in the Psalms that he was going to do it. Man, the truth, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the truth tastes far better. The truth tastes far better than the lie. And, and, and anybody that's listening to us today, just think about how many times the lie have made you cry. Right. Somebody came and lied to you and it angered you and somebody broke your heart with a lie and you cried. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. But we won't do it when we're lied to about the scriptures Uh -uh. and spiritual matters in your eternal life. We won't cry about that. Oh, man, I was lied to. Oh, let me go after that guy. You know, (laughs) this even how to be deceived. That's what the lie do. It teaches you how to go out there and teach others how to deceive. Right. And how to be deceived. If you think you can lie to somebody, somebody out there got a better lie to get you with, you know. And so so it just if people would just take their time and just stop and listen to what's really being said to you, then you would sort of stop with that burning bush experience and say, let me listen to these two guys. Let me sit down a moment and really listen to what these two guys saying, because it's making some sense. Yeah. It's 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 just making some sense. Yeah. It ain't just sounding good. It makes sense. Mm-hmm. Perfect sense. That if I take away my name, how can I say I'm still that person? Right. The law tells you what sin is. And it tells you the punishment. It tells you sin kills you. Mm-hmm. I mean, why would you take away the thing that is going to warn you of danger? Right. That's the problem with the delusion. You can't think rationally. You can't. There's just no way that you can't. You deny reality. I mean, it's wild to watch, you know. I, I, this last week has been a real eye opener for me. Maybe you can read Yeshua's own words to them. That we've been doing that. Yeah. We've been doing that video after video. Who you no takers? Believe. Yeah, no takers. And when Yeshua say he think, don't think that way. But you're gonna believe this man say think that way when Yeshua say don't you think that? Yeah. But he said yeah, think it. You think that? Do you way. think that? Right. Oh, <laughs> it's like the old push me pull you. Uh, it Remember that? It, it, it literally <laughs> doesn't make sense. Yeah. It doesn't. So you mentioned something about Mark seven about eating of bread. Yes. That's what we were talking about. Oh, that you already Pretty said much that. of that was so, yeah, so, unclean hands. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. And so, not unclean food. So um, you said that one of your favorites was Matthew 5, 17. Uh-huh. So I put in here um, a few verses here. So I'll go ahead and read them mm-hmm. for the public. Let your light with luminescence rays so shine to radiantly, brilliantly before men that they may see your good moral, good works as an occupation and glorify by rendering honor to your Father in heaven. Do not, to the point of denial, think I came to destroy, loosen, overthrow, or disintegrate the law of Moses and the Gospels as a prescription or the prophets. Mm -hmm. I did not come to destroy, loosen, overthrow, or disintegrate it, but to fulfill, and by making it completely perfectly, uh, preaching it to its perfection. Mm -hmm. Verse 18, For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, that is perished, doesn't exist anymore, Mm -hmm. one jot, a small part of the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, or one tittle, the apex of a Hebrew letter, will by no means in any way possible pass or perish from the law of Moses and the Gospels as a prescription till all is fulfilled by coming into being or in existence. Verse 19, whoever therefore breaks by dissolving or destroying one or first of the least in the size and dignity of these commandments, that is an authoritative prescription, and teaches as to learn not to do them, two men, so shall be called out loud least, which is far less than least, in by those resting currently in the kingdom, the realm of rule of heaven. 
But whoever does by executing without delay and teaches to the point of acting on them, he shall be called out loud, great, mighty to the point of fear, and in by those resting currently in the kingdom, the realm of heaven, of rule uh, of heaven. Verse 20, for I say in boasting to you that unless your righteousness, justified character exceeds as is to superabound in quality and quantity the righteousness of the scribes, who is a professional writer, and Pharisees, a religious separatist, you will by no means, by absolute denial, enter the kingdom that is the rules of heaven. Verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger in a state of liability and imputable of the judgment as a decision of tribunal and damnation from the divine law of Torah. Guarantee you haven't read that in your Christian Bible or Catholic Bibles. And, and, and um, in their Bibles, in your Bibles, in your Christian Bible, all of that is wrote in red, and you're being taught that Jesus is talking. Whose word are you going to take when he's saying, don't even think that I came to do what this guy is telling you I came and done? He's giving you another Jesus. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's not talking about me. But if you don't know me, you wouldn't really know he's not talking about me. He's talking about that same imposter that was in the garden saying that he changed it. He didn't really mean right. what he said. And he's telling you it is own words. I don't know how clear it can be, John. I really don't. And I don't know what the big dilemma was. I wrestled with it. I wrestled with it coming in. But it was something about the truth yeah. that said I don't care what's going on around me. It's in the scriptures. And they telling me this is him talking. So am I going to listen to him? Am I going to listen to his voice? Or I'm going to listen to this strange voice. He says his sheep know his voice. Are you really his sheep? Are you going to be this other guy's sheep and believe what he's saying? But are you the sheep of the master? Are you the sheep of the good shepherd? Are you going to follow the wolf and get ate up? It's your, it's your choice, but the words are written, John. They're right there. And we're here, and we're um, petitioning and trying to compel the people. Just listen. It's a beast. It's the one that's proclaiming to be a beast. Whether he's the beast or not, who are you? Are you a child of the most high are you a son of Yahweh are you a, a, a co um, citizen a fellow citizens with the citizens of Israel or not not someone that's claiming to be of Israel but of the true Israel of Yahweh <coughs> um, the Bible say Abraham had two sons which one are you which son are you? You the one that just wanted the gifts and gone about your business? Or are you the one that want the promises? Mm -hmm. Which are you? The free woman or the, the bond woman? Which which one choose? Of Hagar. Choose this day. Yeah. But let's stop it. You don't have to respond to us, but I guarantee you it's something pricking at you and you better listen to it because it's calling you to repentance. Right. It's waking you up. It's saying, wake up. Wake up from your sleep. That lie has put you to sleep. You take it, brother. Yeah, well said. So, yeah, good point, because he's of the bond woman. Mm -hmm. He's from Ishmael. Mm -hmm. And so he's of the bond woman. Hagar, it's the covenant of Hagar. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to sell everybody into the covenant of Hagar. Mm -hmm. Paul talked about that, which is the one he says is illegitimate. Mm -hmm. Uh, you brought up, uh, did you cover this yet? Uh, Romans chapter 1, 24 through 27. I don't, I don't think we got to that one yet. You want to cover that? Uh, you, you ain't put the clip up. No. He was saying what it was about. Uh, well, this is the next clip right here. 
that's on the foods, what we're talking about now right there, right? Well, this is additional proof of that, uh -huh. that he's giving. Uh -huh. So let's go ahead and go there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here it is. I'm sorry. I need to read this for the public so they have a context. So in this next clip you're going to see, uh, he cites the Quran as additional proof of this, which is what I had said from the beginning as one of his uh, methods. And uh, and then he's going to talk about um, the food. I'll let him say it. It's better that he says it. If I can get my mouse to work, there it is. That not all of the laws, all of these hundreds of laws that the Israelites had in the fourth covenant were obligatory upon them, but rather, or were directly from God, but rather a lot of them were adopted because they themselves requested or wanted or needed these laws because of, um, you know, the way they were, the way they were used to uh, life in ancient Egypt. So here he's trying to basically say all food was permissible for the children of Israel, except for the foods that Israel had um, made for themselves as impermissible. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is just contradictory to Torah, because all you got to do is go to Leviticus 20. Uh, no, uh, I forget which. Where is it in Leviticus? 26? I don't remember exactly. Sorry about that. Where it lists all the dietary laws, mm -hmm. you know, and Yahweh clearly speaks and says what is clean and unclean. Mm -hmm. So he can't use the argument that the Jews, he'll say the Jews, it's really Israel. The Jews are only one tribe out of the 12. Um, but he can't use the argument that they made those laws because mm -hmm. Yahweh says, this is what I deem as unclean for you to eat. Mm -hmm. And it's an abomination to eat it. So they can't take away something that they didn't make. This is written in stone, so to speak, in Yahweh's hand. And like I said, John, it's already written for you. Not Moses, not Aaron, not the prophets ever went to the children of Israel and say, I said. They said, does say Yahweh. Yeah, right. Amen. They're bringing yeah. him. Mm -hmm. He's giving the instruction. Mm -hmm. If they want Moses wanted to know something, he had to go to Yahweh. Aaron wanted to know something, he had to go to um, Yahweh. That's a tabernacle meeting. Yes. We're going to meet here on deciding yes. issues. How to get the people clean. Right. I, I, uh, he had to tell Aaron how to do it. There was an order, a protocol to it. Yeah. And so whatever silver laws they had, it came from Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And the silver law still exists to this day. Right. And I always tell people, yeah, um, Yeshua sit there and he says it's a new covenant and it's in his blood. But he hasn't taken anything from the Torah mm -hmm. because the Torah tells you without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So we all call Yeshua Jesus our sacrifice. He was sacrificed. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You still going out and you killing the sacrifice because he had to die. Every day. You killed him. Mm -hmm. He died because of you. Isaiah said his um, suffering was our wrong made his sufferings. That's his strikes. He got strikes because of us, because of the sin. And so now you need to repent and you need a sacrifice with blood. To offer to Yahweh. Although you ain't physically do it, you acknowledging that some blood was shed. So you acknowledging when you profess to be a sinner that you needed some blood to get that sin away from you. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that is they'll say that that's OK. We can do that every day. We can slaughter Jesus every single day uh -huh. and he'll forgive us, you uh -huh. know. But if your husband or wife was going out playing behind your back every night and you was catching them and they wouldn't stop doing that, I guarantee you wouldn't be forgiving them. <laughs> so what do you got? A double standard? You know, uh, they're not stopping to think what it not. is, whose voice are they listening to? What am I being led to believe? Uh, it's taking me away from the voice that came from heaven. Mm -hmm. It's taking me away from the manna. That came from heaven because I don't want that bread. It ain't enough. Let's go back into Egypt where we was able to eat whatever we wanted to eat. Mm -hmm. 
It's the same voice. It's the same spirit that has captured so many today that they don't hear us, John. They just pass right by these words. Not and applicable. Don't, don't even understand yeah. what it is that you are walking right into destruction. You walk into the lake of fire and don't even realize it. You know what, Anthony? Um, I've had a little time to think about this in the last couple of weeks. And um, based on the timeline when this man came on the scene, mm -hmm. as best as I can estimate, and what's been going on with Israel and, and all this other stuff, I figure right about now we got three years before this guy goes from this diplomatic discuss, discussion that he's having to persuade you to come to his side and acknowledge him as the Mahdi, the end time Messiah before he decides to turn into the beast and goes off to everybody else that resist him. Mm -hmm. You got three years, the way I'm figuring it. As best as I understand it right now, you got three years, basically to this month. Okay? So you don't got a lot of time to be playing this nonsensical, religious, false doctrine game of denial that I'm seeing so many people play. Mm -hmm. And it's not just in the Christian church. Mm -hmm. It's with secular, it's with Hebraic roots. Um, there's a number of Hebraic roots that won't let this video be seen. Mm -hmm. And if there's any people that I would have expected that would want to embrace this and get it out there to warn their people, it would be the Hebraic roots. Mm -hmm. They're not allowing it. The vast majority are not allowing it. They're in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. They're in deep trouble. Let's move on to um, the next clip. And so what's going to happen here is he's now, now he seeks a new meaning of eat my body and drink my blood. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at that one. So now we seek to understand what is this secret meaning? of consuming the flesh and blood of Jesus that is not so secret that the Israelites understood it, but that we here now don't understand. When we look in the Oxford Bible, we find that there is this very odd incident that takes place, which we must mention in order to understand what is to come. In the time of Moses, Moses apparently does not circumcise his child. And Moses is told by God to go confront Pharaoh. And it says that as Moses is on the way, he stops at a hotel, at a, at a place to spend the night. And it is there that God attempts to kill Moses. And so the wife of Moses, Zipporah, immediately she knows what the reason is. And she grabs the son of Moses and she circumcises him. And she takes the flesh from the circumcision and she touches with it the feet of Moses. And we automatically assume that you know, she just took the flesh from the circumcised child and she knelt down and touched the feet of Moses. Except that it says feet at the very bottom of the page. It says feet is a euphemism, which means genitals. Okay, so in here is an example of what I had said earlier about how he uses external um, sources for the foundation of his argument. So he cites this Oxford Bible that has footnotes that they're claiming that the term feet in the Old Testament just means your genitals. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he's doing in this particular video clip, trying to establish now what what feet really means and get you to buy into that. Uh, did the Oxford Bible um, give any footnotes, any... Um like strong concordance. Uh, I didn't go to look that far. Uh, you know, th this video is not intended to be an extensive research. Right. It's about a quick observation of key statements he's making in this teaching mm -hmm. and uh, rebutting them. 
and that my point here is is that how come he doesn't use other sources besides Oxford? Is Oxford the only one that cites that? And it doesn't agree with various institutes that I've looked up on the term feet. They don't agree that it means genitals. So, but let's talk about that just for a second. Because what struck me when I listened to what he was saying, so you're telling me Sephora cuts off the foreskin. Mm -hmm. That foreskin is now dead mm -hmm. and it's dirty. Mm -hmm. And you're going to take that and you're going to put it on the genital of Moses. Mm -hmm. And what is that supposed to do? He don't tell us. Mm -hmm. How does something dead now cut off from a body wind up benefiting Moses by putting it on his, his genitals? If you went along with his argument, yeah. he doesn't say. Mm -hmm. So what's the point of it? Perversion. A, perversion. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. He enjoys teaching about perverse things, which we're going to get more into. Don't get relaxed, audience, because this is going to get more heavy as it goes on. Mm -hmm. Just bear with us. Mm -hmm. So here in this next clip, he now tries to further establish this concept of the feet not being the feet, but being the genitals. So now he's going to lay down another argument using David and Uriah storyline. So let's listen to Good. that. And Uriah, when David was trying to command Uriah to go down and sleep with his wife, what did he say? He said, go down and wash your feet. For wash your feet was a euphemism for sleep with your wife. Wash your feet by entering upon your wife. And all scholars um, agree that that is what was meant when David told Uriah to go and wash his feet. It was not meant that he would physically wash his feet, but rather he would go sleep with his, with his wife. So here... Uh, it's not true what he's saying that all scholars, mm -hmm. all scholars mm -hmm. agree this is what it means. All scholars don't agree mm -hmm. with what that means. So that needs to be corrected right then and there. Um, so here he's claiming that it means genitals, but it's a euphemism, actually, when you look at it. To go home, it's kind of like we would say in our culture, go home and take a load off your feet. Mm -hmm what's the what's the uh the premise of this storyline he'd been sleeping on the doorstep of david mm -hmm. i think for several days mm -hmm. so he hasn't had a shower he's his feet are dirty he didn't want to go home he want i think he wanted to protect david whatever it was and david was kind of getting a little upset cuz he wanted him to go home and have sex with his wife because he didn't want him to find out that he got his wife pregnant right you know, this is the plain, literal understanding of the text, mm -hmm. not this nonsensical, euphemistic stuff he's trying to get across and saying that it means go home and have sex with your wife, that he's talking about his feet. Mm -hmm. He wanted him to go home. You clean your feet. In those days, you clean your feet before you come in the house. Okay. And then you go home and you relax. You've been on duty for days. Go home and relax and get a load off your feet. That's really what it meant. Yeah, and he probably don't mention if David said, okay, go clean your feet and go in unto your wife. Right, that's a term that's usually used. That's used for sex, go right. in unto your wife. Right. And the euthanism, how many of us even know what that word means? Which word? Euthanism. Euphemism, yeah. Simple people like me. Uh-huh. You know, <laughs> and who knows? what kind of people in the audience that he's listening to, but he's putting this stuff online and how many other people just skip right across that road. Let, let me stop and see what this word truly means. Right. That it's a euthanism. Well, is it a definitely uh, a definite um, Literal synopsis meaning? Yeah. meaning that it means feet, just like feet mean feet. Is it that, does that word mean that, you know? And so, we as 
just in the natural mind, we skip past that because we looking at his um, demonstration of what it means, but not definition of what it means. You know, his definition is what it means. It's a euthanism. Well, what the heck is a euthanism? Yeah, it's kind of like a salesman. You know, when they get you on a car lot, they want to lead you from where you're at and read you mm -hmm. and convince you along the way to get you to the point where you sign the contract and buy a car that maybe you didn't really want to buy. And he leaves out some stuff, you know, because those things would be deal breakers if you really knew, you know, the whole story. And how many people fall into that trap because they don't do their homework? I got to defile Moses. I got to defile Yeshua. I got to defile yeah. them all yeah. so that I can promote who? Muhammad, Allah, and all the rest of the people he named that he he's coming after. But none of the prophets are he coming after down that line, down that lineage. But he's trying to destroy the lineage of Abraham through Isaac. Yes, exactly. He's, he's, he's making them yeah, insignificant. He's discrediting them and saying that they're doing all of this um, abominable things. We're actually, I believe, going to get to some, that aspect mm -hmm. of him diminishing Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's coming up, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so the next clip we're going to look at is what is the meaning of flesh? Mm -hmm. So he's continuing on now with his mm -hmm. laying down his foundation. Let's listen. Of a man's flesh or a man's blood. What is the meaning of that? We find that they write and they said that flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood is my seed, is my son is my descendant, is my sperm. The sperm, sperm was co commonly referenced to in ancient times as the flesh or the blood of the man. For the flesh or the blood of the man is preserved or kept in his seat. Okay, so there you go. He's giving you his definition. I won't disagree with some of it. The problem is with some of these arguments is where is it going to take you? Mm -hmm. And how is it going to be applied in a in a similar but very different context? Mm -hmm. And that's where the trick starts to come in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like going to a magic show and you see them moving different props around the stage and you see these beautiful girls distracting you, walking around on the stage, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff and smoke and lights and, mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And meanwhile, you don't realize where he's really taking you, mm -hmm. that when he positions this thing over here and this over here, he's setting you up for the illusion. Mm -hmm. But your brain don't catch it. So... He has the advantage because the audience, you spoke earlier about knowing the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. He knows the end from the beginning, uh -huh. but those who are watching this don't know the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so you're being dragged and led along the way like a dumb sheep and you're buying into it. Mm -hmm. And this is what he does. Mm -hmm. um, next clip is going to be about Joshua. Jesus begins to teach odd things. Now we're going to start to get in to some interesting stuff. Let's see here. Odd things, right. Talking to people, and he begins to discuss or refer to odd things. In one such example, he walks upon a well. It was a well that had been dug up by Jacob. And there was a woman, a, a, a Samaritan woman, a woman from Samaria who was getting water out of the well. And in this famous incident, Jesus is standing there. And he's looking at the woman. And he asks her, why are you not offering me any water? And she says, because you're a Jew. And I'm a woman from Samaria. And I didn't think that the likes of you would drink from the likes of me because the Jews used to consider them impure. 
Then Jesus tells her, rather, it should be you who is asking from me for a drink. For I can give you a drink of the living waters. You just have access to normal waters. Water that when you drink from, eventually you are thirsty again. But I have water that's alive. Water that people who drink from it are never thirsty again. And then she begins to ask him, what are you talking about? What are these living waters? And where can I find them? And Jesus tells her, go fetch your husband and I'll show you. And then the story ends at that. Well, everybody knows that living waters is a word that can be given to sperm. Okay, so an interesting clip, and I've seen a couple of things in this now that I didn't recognize before. Just what is he trying to get at? Because if you go in the context of the clip before, mm -hmm. he's talking about semen is the water of life. Mm -hmm. And so he says to her, go and get your husband and I'll show you. How do you read between those lines? What does her husband have to do with him showing her the waters of life? Is he suggesting that you bring your husband and I will give him the rivers of flowing waters, my semen? Make him clean, and because you're his wife and he's your covering, then you can become clean? Because mm -hmm. this whole theology is based on a righteous man. All his bodily fluids are clean. Uh -huh. You can't be defiled. Right. So if he imparts his semen to her husband, he becomes clean. And then when she touches him she becomes clean it's that's his that's got to be his narrative that is his i'm telling you from the other videos uh -huh. that is his narrative i just caught this just now uh -huh. meditating on i wasn't paying that close of attention and just to so show you how this stuff can go over your head and i already know what to look for mm -hmm. He's seducing people yeah. into that state though to let certain things like I, I looked at it a totally different way because I've read the story. And she says the man is not her husband. Yeah, right. So how would he send her after? Right. Well, that's another lie. Oh, that's yeah. another lie. You we, know? Yeah. we already know that the man is not her husband. And he says, you have said right. Se you had several. Several, right. And the one that you're with is not your husband now. So how is he going to send her to go get her husband? Right. He needs a husband. So expounding on that, mm -hmm. he needs a husband. So he makes one up in her storyline mm -hmm. so she can bring him to get the semen from Yahshua mm -hmm. so that she can see how he gets the river of living waters. See, the husband don't exist in the text. He lied about it. John, John. Baruch Hashem. Can you hold yourself back? Yeah. You're going to be able to restrain yourself? <laughs> May is going to jump for joy on this one. Oh, yeah? Yeah. This stuff is real. You ever heard of this famous person named Tyler Perry? Yeah. Well, he has this sitcom out called Ruthless. I and they got this cult there. And this guy called himself the highest. The Rockadouches is the name of the, the, the cult. Okay. Oh, a cult. Okay. Yeah. And the leader called himself, everybody calls him the highest. But in, in order for any of the women to have a pure seed of pure seed, the man has to come in and lay with the highest so that they can ah. take his sperm and lay with the women. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So this stuff is this is in a sitcom? Yeah. This in, well, I don't I, I call it sitcom, but it's like a series. Really? It comes on 
weekly. It's real perverted. Real perverted. Wow, that's new for me. Yeah, it's really perverted. This guy writes some. So it's the same concept. Yeah, this guy writes some perverted stuff in all the movies that he makes is full of perversion. But he claims to be a Christian. Unbelievable. I'm telling you. That's wild. The what came to you, what is he suggesting? Is literally being acted out in front of millions of people. That all this perversion, men with men, women with is so widely promoted and accepted. But what does the scripture say versus what's being taught? Yeah, the Torah is very clear in this world today. Torah that is very this clear. stuff is all right. That, that a man that, cannot sleep with another yeah. man as he does with a woman. So, but he's suggesting that Yeshua did it, right? Wow, that's got to sink in. Okay, so the next clip we're going to look at is uh, where he talks about the woman who falls at Yahshua Jesus' feet. Mm -hmm. So we'll go ahead and let him uh, talk about that. In which he is invited to the house of a scholar for dinner. And he goes to the house. The scholar walks out for a moment. He goes into the other room. All of a sudden, a woman who's, who's known to be a prostitute in the area she enters in upon Jesus. And it says that she falls down at Jesus' feet and begins to perfume it and begins to kiss it, his feet. Well, for any Jew who was living at that time, these verses, this story, the description of this story is clear. The scholar walks back in. He finds this woman kissing the feet of Jesus and washing the feet of Jesus with her hair. Her hair is on the feet of Jesus. He's shocked. He's horrified. He's disgusted. He says, how can Jesus be from God? If he's allowing an impure creature like that to kiss his feet and to put her hair on his feet. Well, if we were talking about physical feet, the normal feet that we know here in, in this year, then why would he be horrified? Why would a scholar be so heartless that he would object to a woman who's a sinner prostrating down and kissing the physical feet with toes of Jesus if she believes him to be the Messiah or believes him to be a prophet or messenger from God. No scholar would object to that. In fact, we find the scholars in those times and in these times constantly having people kissing their hands, let alone their feet. And he wasn't upset because for the sake of the woman he was upset for the sake of Jesus because she was impure but he would object and it would make sense that he object if it was in the other context there you go so just like I had said Joshua in his story wouldn't be defiled by her impurity mm -hmm. because he's a righteous man right. and his semen is the wor is the waters of life. Mm -hmm. And so he, in theory, according to him, would be purifying the prostitute, as he would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's why it was not an issue. Mm -hmm. But this furthers his argument of another storyline about feet not meaning literally feet, it means genitals. Mm. So she obviously, in his storyline, he didn't say it, but the implied is she would be receiving his sperm, mm -hmm. which would give her the waters of life. Mm -hmm. 
and make her clean. Mm -hmm. There's no other way to cut it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what this guy's saying to our Messiah. And so Christians and Catholics who call on the name of Jesus, who say, I don't want to know anything about this, mm -hmm. should be ashamed of themselves. Mm -hmm. Because anybody who's defaming your Messiah, he defended you. Why won't you defend him? Mm -hmm. And that's my gripe yes. with people. Yes. And so we're sitting here defending him mm -hmm. and showing to people who supposedly believe the same. And they don't want to know nothing about it. So how do you think he feels when you refuse to defend him? Anything you want to say? I just question whether they have his spirit because he opposed everything that wasn't of Yahweh when he was here right. in the flesh. Right. You know, and again, by reading and knowing, you would understand that there were no scholars that believed that Yeshua was the prophet. No leaders of that time believed that he was a prophet or the Messiah. Matter of fact, they called him Bezabub, uh, mm -hmm. a devil himself, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so why did he end up, who was the leaders of that time and the Pharisees, what he would call scholars and scribes, scholars, who who was it of them that believed that he was the Messiah? I, I know one ran to him, Nicodemus, mm -hmm. but I know no others. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So he's, I'm telling you this narrative, he's um, drawing for the people, for his audience, is to paint this picture that Yeshua was so widely accepted when the prophet said he would be rejected and despised. Mm -hmm. Who are we going to believe? Mm -hmm. Who are we going to believe that he was so believed in and so followed and, so, and you know, and, uh, by all the leaders <laughs> of that day? When you read the scriptures for yourself, you open up the Bible for yourself and see that it's just the opposite. Yeah, right. But those people don't read the scripture that are sitting at that table with him. They don't read it. So they're just going along with what he's telling them. And he's leading them into perversion. I don't know who in that group may hear us and want to come out of that. Right. You right. know, and and prayerfully. And, they, not, and not only that, you know, now you got me thinking about something. He's got 12 disciples sitting at his table mm -hmm. mocking the Lord's table, <laughs> the Messiah's table mm -hmm. for the Passover, mm -hmm. right? And um, I got to wonder if any of them have taken his semen. Is he practicing what he's preaching? Did they all get to sit that table with him because they were willing to take his semen? And they want to be holy because he's holy. Yeah, they want his seed because they pure. want to be like him. Yeah. They want to talk like him. They mm -hmm. want to wield the sword like he's going to wield. Mm. That's scary. It's wild. Mm. Okay, next video clip. The most disturbing event of the Passover supper. Mm. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to let him talk about that. Tells his disciples, are you ready? They say yes. He walks up to Simon Peter. Jesus takes off his shirt. Jesus wraps a towel around his waist. He's standing there with a towel around his waist. And he informs Simon Peter that he is going to wash his feet. Simon Peter's horrified. Simon Peter objects. Simon Peter says, no, I can't. I will not. I cannot allow. Jesus insists, tells him it's the only way. He will not go to heaven unless now we proceed. And so they proceed. Now, if we take washing feet in this incident, 
and in the other two incidents in Jesus' life and say that there is no reason why if the washing of feet meant in the story of David and Uriah as having sex or sleeping with or the uncovering of feet meaning the uncovering of the genitals or the touching of feet meaning the touching of genitals if we assume that the same meeting for these Jews in the time of Jesus meant the same in the time of Moses and, and, and David and Samuel and beyond well then it becomes clear what happened at the final supper and it became clear what was the flesh and the blood of Christ in which the disciples consumed which filled them up with the Holy Spirit what these living waters were that the disciples had drunk from it is the water the seed of the Messiah now I don't know if Anybody caught what he was saying? But what he was saying, in case you didn't, is they were going to perform oral sex on him. Hmm. There's no way in his theology that Yahshua would perform oral sex to receive the semen of the disciples because they're unclean. Mm -hmm. He's the righteous one. Mm -hmm. And remember what he said. He said, and this is his contradiction. Think about it now. This is how you got to pierce into the darkness to see the fallacy. He said in the clip, I'm going to wash your feet. Mm -hmm. So he's in the storyline, which is true. Yahshua is going to give to them. Not the other way around. Because on the one hand, he's saying that he's going to do it to them. But it almost sounds like what he's really saying is that they're going to perform the oral task on him. Mm. Because after all, they need the rivers of living water. They can't receive the rivers of living water if he does it to them. Mm -hmm. They have to do it to him, like in the example at, at the well, mm -hmm. when he said, go get your husband and I'll show you the rivers of living water with your husband. Mm -hmm. And just like in the storyline that you said a minute ago about Tyler Perry, about this high priest or whatever you said, mm -hmm. how they have to come to him. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how many people caught the devil talk. Mm -hmm. The text says Yahshua is imparting to them, mm -hmm. not the other way around. Right. Well. So to sum up what, what I was uh, saying, to be clear, Yahshua tells Peter to drink from his sperm the seed of life. Mm -hmm. The fluid of a righteous man is pure. Semen, urine, tears, sweat saliva, and other bodily fluids. Mm. You have to get it from the source. Mm -hmm. You can't get it from somebody who doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. So his video clip has a flaw built into it. Because the text says one thing, he's imputing another. Yes. He sure is. He's leaving the cup. Yeah. It Joshua gives, we receive. Mm-hmm. In the cup, which they had to drink from the cup, you know, and he's um, painting a picture of them getting down, doing the fish washing and drinking from Yeshua and never the elements that are on that table. Yeah, he doesn't cover. None of that. No, he doesn't cover that. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. No, because in his theology, as I understand it is. It's only after they perform this act yeah. that they receive the rivers of flowing water. And that's what allows them to become the apostles and do the same miracles that Yahshua did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So he's removing, like, like you say, he's basically removing the importance of the blood and the bread, mm -hmm. the body and the blood. Mm -hmm. And he's going straight for the semen, which is the perversion part. Mm -hmm. He's got to slip the perversion in. Mm -hmm. And he's removing even the Catholics, even though they don't have the unliving bread, they got what they call a communion cracker. The wafer, yeah. But um, just think about the matzo that's got to be removed out as unliving bread mm -hmm. because everything flows through fluid now. It's from his body. Right. And so it's the fluids of his body. Mm -hmm. The flesh is the fluids. The blood is the fluids. Right. And he's tying all of them in to the semen. And it's just perversion. Well, this goes back to Daniel again that I read from the beginning. These are pompous, arrogant words being spoken against the Most High and against Yahshua. Mm -hmm. He's just... He's just trash talking politely, so to speak, mm -hmm. through this creative reasoning that he's using. Mm -hmm. um, you want to cover the uh, Exodus 4, 26 through 27, the idea of um, the feet, meaning the genitals and what you found? That's it. That's the narrative what he has painted by mm -hmm. using Moses, right. you know, and, and saying that. Moses' son, Yahweh was going to kill Moses if he didn't um, circumcise his son. So Zipporah went and circumcised him and put the flesh not on his literal feet, but on his um, genitals. Mm -hmm. And so, like I asked before, when, uh, you know, when he stated the Oxford Bible, where did he get that from in there that that word feet meant genitals? Well, he's saying in the footnotes yeah. at the bottom of the page. Here in Exodus. In, uh, um, um, he's in the aromatic, it means ragal. That's foot. The plural is ragalim. Right. Which, Which is more than feet. one. Feet. Yeah. Right. It, everywhere and, in scriptures is being. Okay. Uh, uh, Ragaline, yeah. Yeah, it's this this is the uh uh word for it. Right. Feet. Right. In the scriptures, in Hebrew aromatic, both translation. Mm -hmm. It translates that. And so mm -hmm. Messiahdom is sitting at the table and he's the only one that taking off uh his clothes and girded himself with a towel, mm -hmm. they says. And so now he's he's painting the picture that everybody is getting up and standing in line and wait. Mm -hmm. But how much semen can he give each and every? He's a river of flowing water. Yeah. It don't stop. Uh, that's the conclusion I come to. Um, out of his own words that he's describing, mm -hmm. you know, which is abominable. Um, but that regaline, to come back to that, most of the... Not, I don't know if it's most, I didn't look it all up, but a lot of times what it's referring to is feet that go to and from the feast. Right. You know, it's traveling with your feet, right. going by foot to the feast three times a year, you know, as you're commanded uh -huh. in scripture. Yeah. So it uses that word a lot in that. that it just means feet. It just means feet. Yeah, right. You know, uh, um, he used another one with Ruth at Boaz's feet. Right. Well, when Ruth woke up and got out of there and he realized that he went to get permission to marry her. Now, they're under the Torah. Nobody changed the Torah that you can lay with a woman and you ain't married to her. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody mm -hmm. changed that yet. After all, David got in trouble for it. Or uh, else he yeah. wouldn't have had to go get permission. Right. You, you understand? Right. And so he's suggesting that right then that they roof and got this the uh sperm of boys because she uncovered the genitals mm -hmm. and everywhere as he states everywhere in there from moses all the way up to Jesus turned in the New Testament, that word had to mean the same from Moses to David to um, Boaz. Yeah, the prophets and all the way down to Yeshua. It had to mean the same. Well, then he's he's really saying that all of them were commandment breakers. Yeah. 
because in one of them dispensation, if he say somebody changed it, it wasn't changed in one of them. It wasn't changed right. before Moses. All right. So, um, so in his, I had mentioned earlier about his external sources, and I think he has a story that's uh, within the Hadith mm -hmm. to draw this this analogy. I don't remember the whole story. I'll just kind of synoptic downward uh, in a shorter, concise form. Um, so there was a, I don't know if it was a, a Mahdi or an Imam, I don't recall, but he was considered a righteous man. Mm -hmm. And this is the story that's in the Hadith. And he had urinated into a jar and he put it on a shelf and he left the house mm -hmm. and a woman came mm -hmm. and um, she saw the jar and she knew it was his urine and she knew he was a righteous man. So she drank the urine mm -hmm. and it purified her. So when he came back to the house, he found that the jar was empty mm -hmm. and he was inquiring about what happened to my urine that was in the jar. And somebody said that this woman over here had drank the urine. And he said, this is a woman that will never see the pits of hell, the fire of hell mm -hmm. that she's made whole. Okay. So this is the kind of stories that I'm trying to say from the beginning, these philosophies where they come from, that's the foundation. So you as a Christian or Hebraic roots or Catholic, whatever, you can't accept this stuff. Mm -hmm. You can't accept this stuff. It, it, it's so opposite. You it know, is. Even in Yeshua time, he was ridiculed for going in to unclean um, right. people. Oh, right. he's going into center houses. But right here with his story, he's saying a sinner went into a righteous man house and he wasn't even there. Yeah. Was she breaking in? Don't know. And uh, stole from him right. some righteous stuff right. so that she could be righteous. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. So now this is where the weaving comes in because there's some truth to what he's saying about bodily fluids mm -hmm. because he uses the example of the saliva of Yahshua, mm -hmm. how he mixes that with the, the soil mm -hmm. and he packs it into the eyes of a blind man and a blind man is able to see. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he gives you case precedents. Mm -hmm. for some of these things. Mm -hmm. We don't have case precedents for semen. That we don't have. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And we don't have it for urine, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. But he uses the saliva as bodily fluid to say, see, that bodily fluid healed this man. Why not the mud? Why not the mud without the, the saliva? Yeah. You know? Uh, the, you could just split those hairs all you want, but my why get mud? Yeah, if you're so loud, he could have done it. He could have just spoke to him and said, "You're yeah. you can see." Oh, we know he done that so many times. Why? Right. But the point here is, is that he's making a case precedence. Mm -hmm. See, this is bodily fluid yeah. being used to heal a man. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me I can't extend that to urine and semen mm -hmm. and sweat. You know, in whatever bodily fluids. Okay. All right. So the next video clip we're going to take a look at is the covenant changes and it's no longer Israel. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. This is what I was saying before about not forgetting what I was, you're going to see at the end. Covenant changes. God keeps his promise, which he made to Abraham that I will make an everlasting covenant with you and your descendants. Abraham says, all my descendants, he says, not the wrongdoers. And the Israelites were wrongdoers. And they broke the covenant. And by killing their Savior and by acting like the Canaanites, God turned his face from them like he did the Canaanites. And the covenant was changed and transferred. And no other prophet or messenger would ever be sent. No other savior would ever be sent to the Bani Israel, to the children of Israel and the Jews again. And the covenant was transferred to the children of Ismail. 
who was also a son of Abraham. Fulfilling the word of God that from Ismail he shall make twelve princes. Now that's interesting. Because that flies right in the face of scripture. Mm -hmm. And Yahshua said, I came not except for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. But before that, in the Old Testament prophecy and uh, scriptures, uh, the scripture says, and all of Israel will be saved. Mm -hmm. And in the book of Revelation, we're told that the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, mm -hmm. Basically, as I understand it, become sons of Elohim, who I believe this man of sin is going to flush out into the open for the world to see the revealing of the sons of Elohim. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is a lie is not bore out by scripture. Mm -hmm. Israel has not been done away with. Mm -hmm. But see, what he's trying to do is he's trying to pave a way so that he can come in and be the man. And replace Yahshua with Jesus. Yeah, that's why he don't want to cite Paul because Paul teaches that Yahweh has not cast off his people, right. which he foreknew. Right. Mm -hmm. Which flies in the face of this man's theology. Exactly. And but that's no his his um replacement theology is no different than the Christianity replacement theology. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they're replacing Israel. They become Israel. Right, right. Right. And so now you just, okay, just like they're being taught today, oh, we don't have to keep the commandments. That's just for the Jews. All we got to do is just support Israel mm -hmm. and we get into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And we say we love Israel. We love the Jews and we support them. and get That's our um, good deeds, you know, to the misfolks that right. they do to get into the kingdom. So he's just switching it. No, your misfolks need to come over here now. Mm -hmm. Not to them anymore because right. they broke the covenant. Right. Hmm? Hmm. And it, it, it's, it's just crazy for those who are studied out there to allow people to fall into this trap without even addressing it, you know? Okay, so the last clip we're going to show, we're winding down now. Um, is for those who doubt his interpretation. So this is how he's going to sum it up. And he's going to give you a visual to, as he claims, prove what he's saying is true through history. So here's the last clip. And for those who, who, who doubt that uh, this interpretation and this meaning of the Holy Supper is true, I argue with them and I say that not only is it true, but those who are at the top levels, those who are in the know, in the Christian church, they know that it is the truth. And it's because they know that this is the truth, but they, and they have a twisted malpractice of it. This is what led to the molestation of so many children in the Catholic Church. Because those who are in the know are attempting to carry out these practices with young boys, which is an abomination. And those who draw and paint sacred images of the Last Supper, they know the secret. And here is the image of Jesus with the disciple in which he loved most. Notice the position of the scroll and notice the position of the disciple. Here, pass it around. Here's another one, lest somebody say that it was simply a mistake. Jesus is pushing down the head of the disciple. They say it's blessing the head of the disciple, but that's clearly not what's happening here, is it, Joe? He's pushing the head of the disciple somewhere else. What about in this one? What's taking place here? And yet, what about this painting? Here's another one, right here. What's happening here yet? 
and what is taking place here? There you go. There you go. So what I had said earlier about what I took away from that one clip mm -hmm. is that they had to perform the act on Yahshua, mm -hmm. according to his storyline, mm -hmm. his theology, mm -hmm. not the other way around. Yeah. But the text says he was going to do something to them. Mm -hmm. The exact opposite. He twisted that gospel text in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. He said he was going to wash their feet. So based on his own theology, Yahshua should have been the one doing the act on the disciples, mm -hmm. but not so, because that's not how he thinks. Mm -hmm. So it's a sleight of hand. So you got any closing comments? John, I just, man, I implore the people just to just stop and think about the different doctrines that's coming into this world and the different um, prophets, false prophets, whatever they want to identify themselves that are rising up to draw people away from the truth, you know, and nobody thinks it's important enough to pay attention to it because they think they're in their safety when the Bible tells you it's this destruction that's going to come. And for me, he can be the beast. Uh, he can be an uh, imposter. It doesn't matter. We know the beast is coming. And it's going to happen. It's going to come some perilous times upon the people. You ain't going to escape it. Mm -hmm. And so whatever he's professing to do and it strikes fear in you to obey him. It don't matter because he's going to have them three and a half years mm -hmm. to do his thing. But after that, he's so bold, he don't even realize how really stupid he sounds by professing that because he's admitting that the second three and a half years, it's going to be hell for right, him. Right, right. You understand? Yeah. yeah and yeah. so... I just listen to people sometimes, but if you don't know Messiah, these people will have you lost and tossed all around the place, not knowing which way to go because you don't know who voice you to follow. You know, and so Yahweh has given us an open door, an instrument to sit here and not knowing the purpose of it, but we're sitting here. And we're trying to compel and encourage people to wake up and pay attention to what's going on around you. You know, um, you say, if it's true, then you say, maybe the next three and a half years is really going to be trouble. But look how people are crying and so scared right now. What's going to happen just right here in this country? Then you look over there at Israel and, and, and um, Russia and all the other countries that are at war and people mm. are just scared, don't yeah. know what they're going to do. Mm. And we're sitting over here like, well, you you complaining, too. You can't even you try. You can't even solve this country's problem. Mm. But you over there trying to solve that. That's right. what the confusion that the enemy is all setting everybody up to be in their different deluded states of mind. He's going to crash in and crash their whole kingdom down and they they're going to be lost because they're trying to save their own lives and it's it's so simple what he's doing it's no different than what's happening right now with people um we see hamas landing we see them killing people, and yet they send news out that it's Israel that's mm -hmm. doing the killing. Mm -hmm. And what you get, you get an uproar against people. Tell Israel to stop. Come on, man. You see who's doing it. You, sit, you saw who started it, so why would they stop? It's right there in your eyes, and yet you're believing the lies that are coming out. So it, it wouldn't surprise me that there's so many people that would believe this guy. Yeah. That Yeshua is this perverted person that ordained abomination.
He's so disobedient to his father that his father all of a sudden is accepting abomination. It don't make sense, people. It just don't make sense. Wake up. Just wake up and pay attention to what's really being fed to you. That's it for me. Baruch Hashem. Um, it's really disheartening to see the apathy that I see out there right now. Mm -hmm. The people basically are entrenched in whatever they have accepted as a lie, and they don't believe it's a lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really a paradox yeah. if you're caught in that one. Mm -hmm. But this is what I'm seeing. And... Um, it's really most of the time fruitless to be able to convince people that they've been lied to when they've accepted that lie. That's been my experience. Mm -hmm. But friends, um, the scriptures are clear that we're to come out of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And I said it last time. I'll say it again. I don't care whether you're in Judaism, Christianity, um, Islam, um, Buddha, whatever religion, secular humanism, atheist, whatever you may be, you got to be looking around and knowing that the world you're living in right now is in upheaval. Mm -hmm. We've got environmental stuff going on all over the world. We got government upheaval all over the world. We got wars and rumors of wars going on all over the world. Volcanoes, earthquakes, floods. We've got pandemics, more being threatened to come. And another video, he claims there's going to be more of that that's going to come. Uh, I haven't covered that yet. And um, if this doesn't start to shake you into a reality, nothing is going to. And I would say be prepared for receiving the final mark of the beast. We are, we're not condemning anybody. We're calling on people to do what Yahshua has said. Come out of her, my people, from Babylon, lest you share in her plagues. That's our goal. That's our purpose here, is to alert people to things that nobody else is alerting people to, and it's falling on deaf ears. That's your call. That's your decision if that's the road you want to go down. There's no condemnation in Messiah if you come out from this stuff and humble yourself and accept the fact that you have been lied to and you need to come to Yahshua to ask for forgiveness of your sins. I don't care who you are. So with that said, we bid you shalom and peace in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach. Until the next time.